The Tory leadership race is well underway, with ballot papers having been sent out to the 160,000 members that comprise the selectorate for this leadership election. Unsurprisingly, Brexit plays a central role in the leadership contenders' pitches to the members. What's interesting is how little each differs from a holistic standpoint. Both are committed to renegotiating the withdrawal agreement, and both are committed to no deal on the 31st of October as a last resort. Where they differ, however, is on their methodology. We've already discussed Johnson's plan in another video, there's a link to that in the description. So today we're going to discuss the other candidate, Jeremy Hunt, who has by far the most difficult sell. Like Theresa May, he voted to remain, and more than that, Hunt had a continued presence in the cabinet during the negotiation period, putting him right next to May. This means he needs to overcome the near intrinsic mistrust in former Remainers implementing Brexit properly. These two things are not an issue for Johnson, as he played a prominent role in the Leave campaign and resigned from cabinet in the wake of the Chequers proposal. So Hunt really needs to overcome these hurdles, and that's reflected in his 10 point Brexit plan. Before we get to that though, I wanted to let you know that we have a bunch of new merch designs. They include the Pride Collection, where 100% of the profit goes to LGBTQ charities, the Too Long Didn't Read designs, the Brexit Pumpkin for the build-up of the Halloween Brexit deadline, and the TLDR News design, which even comes on mugs, phone cases and stickers, as if you wanted any of those things. And for three days more, the Island With Shoes design is available. Once it's gone, it's gone. Find all of these and the other designs over on the TLDR merch store. There's a link in the description. Hunt's Brexit plan can be summarised as follows. 1. Immediately ramp up no-deal preparations. 2. Assemble a no-deal cabinet task force. 3. Create a new negotiating team. 4. A tour of the EU27 capitals. 5. Establish a logistics committee to deal with no-deal. 6. Prepare a no-deal budget. 7. Prepare £6 billion of relief to the farming and fishing sector to mitigate a no-deal Brexit. 8. Pursue zero tariffs where sustainable, but maintain them on certain products to protect sensitive industries. 9. Pursue new custom solutions with the Republic of Ireland to avoid a hard border. 10. Demonstrate a parliamentary majority for the Brexit plan before heading to Brussels with a deadline of September 30th to determine if the deal is actually possible. In order to get a full picture of Hunt's Brexit policy, it's essential to take a closer look at each of the policies. Unlike Hunt, I'll be grouping these policies by theme, and not numerically. So first off, let's start with his no-deal policy. Hunt's approach to no-deal has hardened over the course of the campaign. Arguably, this arises from his perception within the party. Most members don't trust him to deal a no-deal exit, because of his previous warnings about the negative effects of no-deal, and his position during the referendum. The interesting aspect about his approach is to cancel all August leave for the civil service. Just how wide-reaching this is is unclear, however given that no deal permeates most areas of government, it can assume that most civil servants will be affected. To strengthen these no deal preparations, Hunt proposes establishing a no deal cabinet task force, similar to COBRA. This task force, chaired by Hunt himself, will seek to identify weaknesses in the government's preparations for no deal to better focus the resources and to strengthen the plans. Additionally, this task force would develop a financial framework in the event of no deal, to support industries adversely affected by a no deal exit. Hunt also intends to establish a national logistics committee, led by the Department for Transport. The committee's purpose is to produce a method of overcoming the logistical impacts of no deal, and to ensure the freest possible flow of goods into and out of the UK. This is important, as the majority of issues arising from No Deal relate to logistics. For example, how to manage lorries denied boarding of ferries from Dover to Calais, and congestion around ports. While the detail is thin, it's a sensible policy, and adds to the seriousness of Hunt's approach to No Deal, which, in turn, increases his credibility. Similar to Boris Johnson, in the event of a No Deal exit, Jeremy Hunt proposes a No Deal budget to be delivered in September. The most prominent changes to the Brexit budget are aimed at businesses. They include cutting corporation tax from 19% to 12.5%, the same as the Irish rate, and cutting business rates for 90% of high street businesses. The likely intention being to boost British competitiveness in response to a fall in investment arising from the economic dislocation that a no-deal exit brings. What's unclear, however, is if such a budget includes deregulation measures in order to maximise competitiveness. These adjustments will be aimed at reducing the regulatory burden placed on all businesses. 
However, if a deregulation framework is to be followed, it would likely be limited to services. Diverging significantly, or at all, from the existing single market goods regulations would provide an extra complication to managing the flow of goods across all UK-EU borders, as they require regulatory checks prior to entry into the EU single market. As well as a no-deal budget, Hunt will also create a £6 billion fund for the agriculture and fishing sectors to mitigate the effects of no-deal. This policy is particularly problematic as subsidising exporters to compensate for tariffs to preserve or boost their competitiveness may be illegal under WTO law. Jeremy Hunt has maintained that he'll continue the government's temporary tariff schedule published in March. Under this schedule, 87% of all goods will be eligible for tariff-free entry into the UK market, with tariffs maintained on just 13% of goods. These include retaining a number of tariffs and quotas on some food products, namely meat and dairy, and a number of finished cars, as well as against products to protect the UK from unfair trading practices such as dumping, and maintaining the UK's commitment to reduce poverty by continuing preferential access to goods from developing countries. This approach will continue to mitigate disruption to the flow of goods in a no-deal exit. However, it raises questions about other processes that affect the flow of goods in and out of the UK. Hunt makes no mention of non-tariff barriers. With the UK in a no-deal scenario, unilaterally recognised EU regulations on goods, food and medicine to eliminate the need for any border checks. In order for such a policy to be successful, Hunt would have to take such an approach in the short term, even if it risks being challenged by the World Trade Organization. This naturally leads the conversation to his approach to the Irish border. Hunt has stated that he'll pursue a new customs solution to prevent a hard border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. At first glance, such a policy is logical, as in any event, the UK and EU would need to manage a collection of tariff duties and rule of origin checks. However, as with maintaining the free flow of goods between the UK and EU, this is about much more than customs. The difficult aspect of maintaining no hard border is managing regulatory checks and divergence in the overall political climate in Northern Ireland. Erecting customs posts either at the border or away from it would pose a security risk. Such risks need to be avoided, given the history of the Troubles and to preserve social cohesion in an otherwise deeply divided society. This issue is compounded further by the lack of a functioning Northern Irish Assembly. Interestingly, Hunt didn't set out a buccaneering trade policy in the event of a no-deal exit. His softer approach, while aggravating some Brexiteers, demonstrates that the UK's primary focus will be on securing a sustainable long-term trading relationship with the EU. Not doing so would not be in the interest of the UK economy, and would further complicate the management of trade between the UK and EU. Hunt also seeks to demonstrate that there's a majority in the Commons for a deal before heading back to Brussels to renegotiate. This is important and shows an understanding of why the EU has been reluctant to make concessions. Theresa May, unfortunately, did more than just annoy Tory MPs and members. She annoyed EU leaders as well. She lost face and credibility when the concessions she promised would pass didn't. This led to the EU losing trust in her and rallying around the unnamed withdrawal agreement. If Hunt is able to demonstrate a clear majority in the Commons for a new plan, his chance of succeeding with the renegotiations are much higher. His intention to include the European Research Group, DUP, and Scottish and Welsh Conservatives may assist him in overcoming this, and demonstrating there's a majority. The domino, so to speak, that's prevented the passage of the withdrawal agreement is the DUP. If the DUP is satisfied, then most of the ERG will be as well, so getting the DUP on side is vital. Hunt has given himself a firm deadline of the 30th of September to decide if a deal is possible or not. If a deal is possible but needs extra time to conclude the renegotiation and ratification process, Hunt is open to a short extension. However, if no new deal is possible, such as the EU refusing to make any concessions, then it's at this point he'll decide that the UK will be facing a no-deal exit on the end of October, stopping negotiations to focus on no-deal planning. Before Hunt heads to Brussels to renegotiate, he intends to do a tour of European capitals in July and August. The most important capitals for Hunt to focus on will be Dublin, Paris and Berlin. Convincing an already sceptical Irish government will be the key to unlocking the backstop deadlock. Paris and Berlin will also be important destinations, as the tacit approval of Emmanuel Macron and Angela Merkel will also be needed. Hunt also intends to create a new negotiation team before heading to Brussels. Hunt proposes a political team which includes members of the ERG, DUP, 
and moderate Welsh and Scottish Conservatives. This team would be led by Crawford Faulkner, the UK's most senior trade negotiator, and, as reported in the Sunday papers, may also be bolstered by former Canadian Prime Minister Stephen Harper and Ronna Ambrose. Harper will provide the team with additional experience in handling EU negotiations, as he led Canada while the EU-Canadian Free Trade Agreement, CETA, was negotiated. The new negotiating team will be tasked with negotiating an alternative withdrawal plan based on the alternative arrangement proposals. The EU has provided a high bar for alternative arrangements. Primarily insisting on maintaining the EU's unity, it cannot separate Ireland from the rest of the EU, maintaining single market integrity, and upholding the principles of the Good Friday Agreement. It's expected that their alternative withdrawal plan will be published by the end of August. The emphasis that Hunt places on no deal is important, but it can't be expressed enough that he is not aiming for a no deal Brexit as his first preference. The majority of his supporters, such as Amber Rudd and David Gork, are not in favour of such an exit. Hunt himself says that he'll only go for a no deal exit if there's no prospect of an alternative deal being agreed, and would do so with a heavy heart. His focus on no deal preparations is to compensate for the perceived lack of preparations over the last few years, which has been seen to damage the UK's negotiating hand. To an extent, this is true. Increasing the threat and credibility of a no deal exit will place added pressure on the EU to make concessions. Ireland specifically will be under pressure from two fronts. Firstly, it will be under pressure to make concessions on the backstop to avoid the negative economic consequences of a no deal outcome. Secondly, they will be under pressure from the EU to lay out their plan for protecting the single market by enforcing regulatory and customs checks at the border. A no deal exit is not in the EU's best interest either as the Eurozone's economy begins to show signs of weakness and the Eurozone structures haven't been meaningfully reformed since the Eurozone crisis, the EU will be keen to avoid such an outcome. A tangible and credible threat of no deal may lead to a shift in the Irish and EU's position. Such a shift, however, is dependent on what Hunt asks the EU for and what he means by new deal. Does, for example, a deal based largely off the existing withdrawal agreement with a modified backstop constitute a new deal? If Hunt were to demand totally excluding the backstop from the withdrawal agreement, as is Johnson's policy, he will likely not make any progress. A time-limited backstop may be possible, especially if the ERG and DUP indicate their support and willingness to pass a withdrawal agreement on that basis. However, this is not a solution in itself, and merely creates limited breathing room in order for them to come up with some more substantial solutions. Despite the ambiguity over several aspects of his policy, the combination of increased no-deal preparations, beginning the negotiation period with a plan that's achieved a Commons majority, a new negotiating team, and a hard deadline prior to the 31st of October, increase the likelihood of Hunt's plan being successful, and the overall viability of his Brexit policy. What do you think of Hunt's plan? Do you think it'll be successful? Do you think he'll even have a chance to implement it? Comment below to let us know. Also, make sure to subscribe to our channel to be notified when future videos are released. You can also find us across other social networks simply by searching for TLDR News.